Hello everyone, hope you are doing well. So as you know, there will be no further you know, regular lectures and we still have three more chapters to cover to finish the course, Fluid Mechanics. So chapter five, six and seven. What we are gonna do, so we are going to actually have delivered these lectures online. So each chapter will be delivered in multiple parts so I will speak, I will teach on the PowerPoint slides and then record it and uh, post it on YouTube. So you can go online on YouTube and watch them as many times as you wish to make sure that you understand the concepts. So the lectures are going to be probably brief compared to the you know, uh, regular lectures, but I make sure to cover everything. Uh, it's going to be efficient and the lectures will take shorter than the regular uh, lecture times in the class because it's more efficient and uh, you know no time will be wasted and feel free to ask questions in the course forum by sending emails by writing comments under the youtube lectures to make sure that you know you understand everything and get ready for the exams all right, so let's get started with this chapter five, part one, dimensional analysis and similarity. So actually we have started, we already you know, started this chapter in the class, but you know, for the sake of completeness, I will repeat the, you know, the part which was already taught as well. So I should acknowledge that these slides have been prepared using the textbook. The Fluid Mechanics by Frank White and also I have used some of the lecture slides from my colleague uh, Simon Fraser University, uh, Professor Barami. So the rest for the rest of these lectures actually this will we will frequently use this uh, uh, materials. So the motivation for dimensional analysis. So why do we want to do dimensional analysis? Here is the reason. So in the previous chapters of the book, we actually talked about the theoretical analysis and we talked about control volume approach, which is good to analyze large scale control volume problems such as a jet engine, then we talked about the Navier-Stokes equations, differential analysis, and we mentioned that the governing equations, Navier-Stokes continuity, and also energy equation, which was which will be dealt with in uh, heat transfer. These equations, in order to solve, in most cases we do need numerical analysis or computational fluid dynamics (CFD). So it may not be practical for most engineering problems. We also have very limited analytical solutions, like cases where we can simply, you know, we can simplify the problem, such as, you know, flow in a pipe. So as a result, in many other cases, we actually do need to perform experiments. An example is a flow uh, like over a wing of aircraft. Nowadays, numerical simulation is capable of doing that, but a long time ago, there was no way of, you know, uh, solving the, you know, the governing equations for flow over these complex objects. As a result, experimental investigation or experimental analysis is the most available and most I mean, the easiest way of, you know, performing uh, many engineering problems. All right. So as a result, we, uh, so now when we, when we want to, you know, perform experiments in experimental studies, so we may face many variables in the problem. So let's say you want to study flow over a flat plate or over a sphere then you need to think about the properties of the fluid, the dimensions, geometry of the problem, and uh, many, many variables. 
So if you want to keep changing many of these variables, like the speed, let's say you want to study the effect of the speed on the forces exerted on a sphere. So then you would need to perform so many experiments by you know by you know varying these variables in order to generate a database. So in order to minimize the number of the experiments, it is very useful to perform a dimensional analysis. So it may be kind of vague to you now, the dimensional analysis, but it simply means that we will go ahead and combine some of these variables together in order to generate a non-dimensional or dimensionless group, such as Raynor's number that you are already familiar with. And then we just need to consider variations in these non-dimensional numbers rather than variations in each individual variable in that non-dimensional number or non-dimensional group. Okay, so these are some of the uses of dimensional analysis. The first one is the one that I already mentioned, reducing the number of variables. As an example, just look at this, like, uh, assume that this is like a flat plate or a flattened uh, two-dimensional cylinder, so something like this, with negligible thickness, with length L, where we flow a fluid such as air or water over this object with the velocity V. The fluid could be air, water, or any other fluid. So first, when it and what's the objective? We want to calculate or we want to estimate the drag force exerted on this object. The drag force would be counterbalanced by a force that would be needed to put or keep this object in place. To you know, so you do have this object. Just imagine that you have kept it in place without disturbing the fluid. And then a flow is passing over this object. So what are the variables in this problem? So first of all, some of the variables are dependent. Some of them are independent. So in this problem, we are interested in calculating the drag force, F. And we see that the important variables in this problem include the length of this object, the velocity of the fluid passing over this object, the density of the fluid, and the viscosity of the fluid. So why density and viscosity? Because density and viscosity appear in the Navier-Stokes or momentum equation. Why not considering CP, CV, and other thermodynamic properties because here we assume that the temperature is kept constant so we are not considering the effect of temperature variations so temperature is not involved so we have expressed the drag force in terms of only the important properties if we insert additional non-important properties the problem will become very difficult so the first the first uh, thing that we do is to understand the problem and list all of the variables. So the drag force is now a function of these four variables. Uh, if we want to study the effect of all of these four variables on the drag force, many experiments would be needed. So it's not economical because experiment, uh, performing experiment costs a lot of money and time. So very soon we will see that if we combine these variables together, we can actually show that force divided by density, length squared, velocity squared, is only can be shown that this force, uh, this force groove, which is non-dimensional, is only a function of rho v l divided by mu which is the Raynor's number in terms of the length of this object, which is close to a plate, flat plate. 
So this means that if we want to study the effect of different parameters on the drag on the force coefficient, so this force over this term in the denominator can be called like can be assumed as a or can be regarded as a drag force, drag coefficient. So this drag coefficient is only a function of the Reynolds number. So if we change the Reynolds number, let's say Reynolds number 100, which has been obtained by given values of these variables, and then if we go ahead and double the velocity, if we double the velocity, then the Reynolds number will be doubled, and then we can study the effect of the Reynolds number directly on the drag coefficient. So instead of doubling the velocity, one other another researcher may want to go ahead and make a make a model which is like double the size of the original one so if you double the length l Reynolds number will be doubled as well so it really doesn't matter whether you want to double the velocity or double the length which the, the one which is easier can be done and the results are applicable to you know to to both cases so this is therefore one use of the dimensional analysis to reduce the number of the variables all right there is also another use and that's the to make the equations the governing equations non-dimensional like the continuity and momentum equation that we derived in the previous chapter those equations are dimensional so it means that if you if you write the equations for a particular problem and change the length scale, then the equations will be, and the solution of the equations will change. However, if you non-dimensionalize the equations, then they are valid. They are valid for a range of parameters. So that would, you know, be very useful, especially for numerical uh, simulation. So you may not see uh, non-dimensional equations in undergraduate fluid mechanics, but this is usually considered in like graduate studies for research and development, and it's a, it's a kind of advanced topic. The third use of dimensional analysis is using a scaling laws. So indirectly i actually have talked about the scaling laws so what does it mean so it means that in this particular problem that we talked about here we know that this force coefficient like a drag coefficient is a function of the Reynolds number only <clears throat> all right so now let's say you are constructing a large let's say flat plate or large thin submarine so that this equation this dimensional analysis is valid for that submarine meaning that for that submarine the drag force is only a function of the Reynolds number okay but in reality if you want to actually design the engine of this submarine you would need to know this drag coefficient for a range of Reynolds numbers to address you know the fact that the velocity of the submarine changes and then the power of the engine would change as well so performing experiments in the full size prototype of the submarine is really difficult because it's very large so experimental capabilities are and facilities are like limited so one use of the dimensional analysis is therefore is to construct small scale models of the full size prototype and then perform the experiments on the models. And in order to be able to use the experiments and the results obtained for the model for the full prototype, we just in this particular particular case need to make sure that the Reynolds number of the experiments of the models is equal to the actual Reynolds number for the prototype. So 
it means that well you of course the prototype is much larger in this particular case so how to keep the Reynolds number of the model and prototype identical so let's look at the Reynolds number so what you see in the parentheses here is the Reynolds number so if you want to construct the model then you would need to decrease the size of the prototype so L would decrease so now in order to keep the Reynolds number the same you will need to increase the velocity or increase the density it's it's if you want to use the same fluid for instance air or water then what you could do is to increase the velocity in such a way that VL the multiplication of VL term remains the same across the model and prototype so now if you if you keep the Reynolds number the same then you can conclude that this term the force term will be identical for both model and the prototype so as a result you can go ahead and write the force ratio for, for prototype and model as a function of their densities velocities and length of the prototype and the model so this means that if you calculate the magnitude if you measure sorry if you measure the force of the prototype and you want to find the force exerted on the real full scale so if you measure the force on the model in the lab fm then you want to find out the force exerted on the full type prototype then you could simply go ahead and use this equation so everything is known here on the left and right side and then you can go ahead and find the force exerted on the full type full scale prototype so it means that by doing experiments in the lab you can get a sense of what are the forces exerted on the actual full-size prototype that's the that's a very important benefit of the dimensional analysis so three uses reducing the number of variables and reducing the number of experiments uh, in the, making the equations governing equations non-dimensional and using the dimensional analysis for the scaling loss in order to uh, develop uh, like correlations and equations and design parameters for the full scale prototype by doing experiments on the on the models so before going ahead and learning about how to actually perform the dimensional analysis we need to <clears throat> remind ourselves that the equation that we use any type of equation in physics or in any other science the equations must be homogeneous it means that each term in the equation must have the same dimension by term we mean the terms which have been separated by plus and minus so this is like a term so the dimension of each of these three terms in the Bernoulli's equation is the same all of them have the dimensions L squared T to the negative 2 L is the dimension for length T is the dimension for the time uh, so before going ahead and see the official way of performing the dimensional analysis let's look at a simple example so this example is like uh, the relation that expresses the displacement of a falling body if you look at the falling body the displacement s is equal to s0 the initial <coughs> position plus v0 the initial velocity times t plus one half g the gravitational acceleration times t to the power of two so this is the equation that expresses the displacement so it's fairly simple 
So this equation is dimensional, right? So this equation is dimensional. So dimension of S is like length, the unit is meter, and the dimension, dimension of all other combined terms is also the dimension of the length L. So in this equation, T is a variable which changes, and then S is another dependent variable that reflects the changes occurred in the time. So T is an independent variable and S is a dependent variable. So S0, G, S0, V0, and G, these are kind of variables as well, but these are like constant. So these, these are kept constant. So these are known, therefore they are usually called parameters. So in this equation, we do have parameters S0, V0, and G. We have independent variable of time t, and we do have a dependent variable s. All right. So if you look at the dimensions of all of these terms, you see that the dimension of all of combined terms is actually L. Okay, so now we want to make this equation dimensionless. So equation, again, S equal to S0 plus V0T plus 1 half GT squared. This is dimensional. So how to make it dimensionless? There are multiple options. So one option is to make it dimensionless using S0 and V0. And then study the effect of G, the gravity. So based on this, we can go ahead and define non-dimensional displacement term S star equal to S over S0. So now this S star is dimensionless because it's S over S0, so length over length, now it's dimensionless. Also, if we use S0 and V0 and combine it with the time, then we see that, okay, so V is meter per second, T is second, so in the numerator we do have meter, in the denominator we have meter as well. So length over length, as a result, this term is called T star, it does have T time in it, so it is a non-dimensional time. So non-dimensional or dimensionless time and dimensionless displacement. <clears throat> so it's like we have in this particular case, because the problem is sort of simple, we managed to just look at the equation and make, come up with these two non-dimensional groups. So now if we go back to our dimensional equation here, and divide all terms by S0, so we will end up with this dimensionless equation. So S over S0 becomes S star, and then 1 plus, if you divide V0T by S star, it becomes T star. So that's why here we do have T star. And the same thing for the last term, when you divide it by S star, when you look at the combination, you see that it can be shown as one half alpha t star squared, where alpha is equal to this term that you see here, and it does include g, the gravitational acceleration. So this alpha itself is another dimensionless or non-dimensional group. So in this problem, we do have three non-dimensional groups. One is s star which is the dependent variable. One is T star, which is the independent variable. And we do have another term alpha, which combines these parameters. And uh, it, it creates another term alpha, which is also non-dimensional. So now we can go ahead and study the variations in alpha. 
So the variations in alpha probably would be if you wanted to study uh, how this equation behaves as you test it on different on the surface of different planets with different values for g. So this g on the moon is different from than g on the earth and so on and so forth. So if you plot S star as a function of T star with different values of alpha, that this would be the curve. So first of, first of all, the one which is a straight line is for alpha equal to zero. So for alpha equal to zero, it means that there is no acceleration. So this is like a constant velocity motion. So it's, displacement is linear, changes linearly with the time. And as alpha increases, we can plot the behavior of S star with respect to T star. <clears throat> so for instance, for a lower alpha, that would be like the behavior of the motion on the moon, and the larger alpha, the behavior on the earth, and so on and so forth. So there are other options as well. In order to make this equation dimensionless and study the effect of other parameters, but this is just one option to show you what what we mean by dimensional analysis. In the book, there are some other options as well. So that was that displacement equation was a fairly simple equation. Some equations are more they have more variables and therefore it is more difficult to just look at the equation and come up with like dimensionless parameters. So as a result, a theorem has been proposed called Pi or Pi Buckingham theorem. So if we follow these steps systematically, we should be able to make a dimensional equation non-dimensional. <clears throat> so what you see here may be a little bit overwhelming. That's why we will immediately follow with some questions to clarify what it means. All right. <clears throat> there, are so, there are some other methods as well, but here in this lecture, we focus on pi theorem only. So let's say you are dealing with a problem, and in the problem, you do have n dimensional variables so including dependent variables independent parameters so we show them by q1 to qn so n variables which are important and relevant in that given problem so we should not just add whatever variable that we think to the problem because that would make the problem very complicated and difficult or impossible to solve or we may solve it but get wrong interpretation and wrong answer. So we need to look at the problem and identify the important parameters and variables only and name them as Q1 to Qn, so n variables. So these n variables are interrelated by an unknown, usually unknown dimensionally homogeneous set of equations that we still don't know. So we can say that f is a function of q1 to qn equal to zero. So this is the mathematical form of showing that these n variables are interrelated. Or we can show one of the variables, which is the dependent variable, for instance, for instance, the force in the case of the drag force in previous problem, force over a flat plate. So this Q1 could be force F, and we can show it F as a function of other variables such as L, rho, the density, viscosity, and velocity. So this is the way that we show it in the functional form. All right. Then we will look at these variables and see how many fundamental dimensions are present in the in this problem 
in fluid mechanics problems usually we do have uh, length we do have uh, mass and we do have the time usually we do have three fundamental dimensions temperature if for instance temperature changes could be another fundamental dimension but oftentimes in the problems that we consider these three dimensions are present length mass time because this these three dimensions can ex explain and express displacement velocity acceleration and force and also properties of the fluid such as viscosity density the fluid mechanics properties all right so we need to identify k the number of fundamental dimensions which as i said it's usually three but we need to verify that <clears throat> so therefore we do have n the number of variables and k the number of available or present dimensions and then this theorem states that the number of dimensionless groups that you can construct by combining all of these variables will be equal to n minus k the maximum it's usually equal to n minus k but sometimes it may be just one less than n minus k and that's a special case so therefore for this problem again we do have n variables k fundamental dimensions and n minus k non-dimensional groups so we call these non-dimensional groups as pi groups so it means that the problem which is or originally <clears throat> written in this form q1 is a function of q2 to qn after non-dimensionalization the problem becomes pi1 so this pi1 is for instance f divided by rho v squared l squared that we had in the previous uh, problem so pi1 is therefore a function of n minus k minus 1 additional uh, pi group so on the right side you may have only one additional pi group or you may have more usually it's one or two so don't worry about this nk this kind of thing so in reality it's much easier than this we will see it in the examples all right so so how to apply the pi theorem for a particular problem so one so these are the steps we need to follow clearly define the problem and think about which variables are important identify which is the main variable of interest so this q1 is the main variable of interest which is dependent variable for instance force that you want to find in that particular problem and then the rest of the variables are the physical fluid mechanical properties such as density viscosity of the fluid length scale of the problem velocity you cannot if you include irrelevant variables you will end up getting confused or getting wrong answers so it is important to physically think about the problem are there any constants meaning that can I vary all these variables independently so if there is a constant the constant should not be uh, usually considered so you consider the variables or if there is like a constant for instance g in the problem that we had before well you can consider that because that's an important parameter and if you for instance move from one planet to another that constant will change as well so it's important to identify all uh, variables in the problem so then express each of n variables in terms of its in the in in terms of its dimensional fundamental dimensions mlt theta m for mass 
L for length, capital T for time, and theta for the temperature, if temperature is involved as well. So each n variable is expressed in terms of these fundamental dimensions. And then the number of the pi groups will be j equal to n minus k, where k is the number of reference dimensions and select k primary or repeating variables. So we do need to select, so during the process we need to select the repeating variable. So do you remember in the displacement problem, we selected S0 and V0 as the repeating variables, and these variables are used in order to create non-dimensional terms. So usually the repeating variables are like fluid properties, geometry, flow rate, and so on. So these repeating variables, when combined with other important variables, for instance, when combined with the force, will create the drag coefficient. So these repeating variables, when combined with the velocity, or for instance, with another property, then they will create a non-dimensional number, such as Reynolds number. Okay, so form J dimensionless pi groups following the process that we will talk about and check that they are indeed dimensionless. And then once the pi groups are found, we can express the results in the form of pi 1, which is like the depend, usually the dependent variable such as force coefficient, drag force, as a function of other non-dimensional groups such as Reynolds number. And it is also always a good idea to double check to make sure that all of these pi 1, pi 2, pi 3 groups are indeed independent and they are dimensionless. So if for instance we can create one group by multiplication of two other groups, so it means that we have done it wrong. And finally, you know, in real world, you know, experiments, exp I mean, in real world engineering, we can then go ahead and use this dimensional analysis and perform experiments and uh, see whether the experiments uh, agree with our dimensional analysis. So this may not be sensible for you now. So, <clears throat> but this is actually for implementation of this pi theorem. Okay, so this brings us to the end of this lecture. I know that there was a lot of abstract concept in this lecture. The second lecture actually starts with some useful examples of the application and how to apply the pi theorem on some problems so that we see how, how it actually works. So make sure that when you watch this lecture, immediately watch the one which comes next in order to be able to comprehend the concept. Thank you for watching.